Hailing from the Jersey Shore and raised as athletes, the Airy Bros have always shared a passion for physical culture, athletic performance, and human optimization. Always striving to be the strongest versions of themselves, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Along the way, they've met some pretty amazing humans and have had some pretty epic adventures. The intention of Airy Bros Radio is to showcase these amazing people and the impact that they've had on them and to share tips, tricks, and hacks so that you can win each day, every day. You're listening to Airy Bros Radio. Be there or be square because it's all killer, no filler. Sovereignty is a must. Um, Babylon tells you scarcity. Truth, God, nature tells you abundance. There's so much, there's enough for everyone. Can, you know, you never condemn the mint, you know, you never tell the rosemary it's bad. <laughs> Creator, it's the creative force from which we all come from, the yad hey bad hey. We're ready made for the earth, bro. Like we came in with the whole package, the skin and the fingers, the sensory organs, the nose, the ears. We got it all, so we don't need nothing from them. Talk about it as it being a metaphysical key to your enlightenment, a metaphysical tool for your transformation to be a better and higher potential living human being on this planet. You know, if you if you got your food, you got your water, you got your power, you got your medicine, like there goes Babylon's thing, like, cause they that's all their power over you. You know, what biological imprint does the, does the food from my region give to my body? This is Logan Silsley from the Institute of Natural Farming and you listen to Aries Bros Radio. Tune in, tap in. That. Which came first, the farming or the Rastafarianism? Is it is it a, um, is it was it a symbiotic kind of cohesion, or, or yeah. how did it all come together for you? Yeah, I mean, like truly, you know, finding that that lifestyle that's known as Rastafari in the West um, was the cohesive like glue that glued all these, you know, life, you know, life affirming ideas together. So what I mean by that is like agriculture or farming you can't really quite say you're a rasta man without having that be part of your life just like you know um you know chanting and uh eating clean food like these are all just tenants of rastafari so to be an an agriculturalist is basically like a prerequisite of even wanting to claim that you're a rasta man you know (laughs) so it all went hand in hand you know yeah right on and yeah i think for most people, most Western people, people in the United States, when they think of Rasta, you know, they think of reggae music, uh, maybe smoking marijuana or ganja. And that's kind of where, for most people, I would say it probably ends. What does it entail and, and how did you discover it? Or how did you get deeper into it beyond maybe say like the music and, and, and the cannabis? Wow. Um great question that's a very loaded question as well i mean i could go a lot of ways with it but um just uh to kind of maybe touch personally for a few minutes you know a little backstory is you know i kind of grew up amongst you know free thinking parents you could say you know maybe the hippie generation but my dad see my dad played an instrumental role because whenever we're in the in uh, his car in his truck going you know he would take us surfing he would take us My dad was a great dad, you know what I mean? He was kind of like that hippie 80s dad, like, you know, he was always drinking and smoking and stuff, but he was still like the best dad, you know what I mean? But anyway, he always played reggae music, like nonstop, like Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Gregory Isaacs, like nonstop, this guy would play reggae music. And just for him, it was just the vibration of it, you know, just that he he could feel something in that music and he grew up when it first came out you know during the 70s and 60s when these were brand new records you know so he still had that taste in his mouth of just like that that you know um real innocent uh kind of fun loving side of, of reggae music and of rastafari so he really imparted that that reggae music onto us by no means was he a rasta man but he uh, imparted you know the reggae music so that was always in my mind and it always stuck with me and of course through like high school and stuff we thought we were gangster rappers and all this bs that the the cultural programmers you know put on us in the 90s you know what i mean so we uh, we went through that too of trying to find ourselves but really that's the key word finding yourself you know and uh when i started coming into more of a, of a, a mature state of mind and into adulthood I also was frequenting these reggae festivals at the time. 
and and when you're at these reggae festivals you you really get a sense of of people living the culture living the lifestyle eating the food so even though it was through the festival kind of um scenery it got me more interested really in in djing and um and and like i wanted to like take this music that had a message that was affecting my life so heavily at the time and and give it out to the public as well so right through like my transition into adulthood was my transition into rastafari and and like if you watch my video on my on my institute of natural farming uh, channel there's a rastafari video on there and i kind of break down you know just like more of from a scholarly kind of point of view more than a personal point of view of like what rastafari is and what i talk about in there is in the beginning i talk about it as it being a metaphysical key to your enlightenment so it's you know there's many paths to for you to get uh, you know to your higher self to understand your uh, you know to harness your animal self and control that and become your higher self you know so uh, like really to me like now that i look back on it as an adult like an older adult i realized that this was like a metaphysical tool like a metaphysical path for me to be a better and more higher potential human being you know so that's really what i attribute it to and you know so i'm coming into adulthood and I'm coming into Rastafari at the same time because I see so many truths in it, you know, that just appeal to me. And it's really kind of like a, um, a guide to live on earth as well, just like many other, uh, you know, uh, God-based, you know, I with lack of a better term, religious systems, but it's not really, it's a lifestyle system. So, so it's like a lifestyle system. So to me, it was like this complete picture of how to be a human. So that's what really attracted me to it. And I started DJing the music because I wanted to get the message out there as how can I tell other people about this? I'm sure just like the feeling of anybody going through a metaphysical transformation with God on their side, you're gonna wanna tell people about it, you know? So I started DJing and then shortly after that, we actually opened a record store and a smoke shop. So, <laughs> so um, you know, so right after I was done with, you know, like 20 something years old, now we have like this, what we call a roots and culture shop here in Hawaii and flash forward 20 years and it's still open today. And that's kind of what I actually do for a living is I run this roots and culture store when I'm not farming, you know? So, um, you know, really, you know, Rastafari really is, like I said, like, I guess I could sum it up with that. It's a metaphysical tool for your transformation to be a better and higher potential living human being on this planet earth, because you live, learn to live in compatibility with it. And you learn about the true God, not like some far-fetched, like, you know take my money at the church kind of situation you know i think that goes right to the next question you mentioned about the true god and uh talk about ethiopian and ethiopian orthodox kind of get into that and what is the true god and maybe what we might believe as westerners and kind of what we've been uh der derailed from yeah like if you look like you said the ethiopian orthodox church is basically the oldest christian church on the planet earth um arguably or not so arguably ethiopian kingdom that haile selassie ended up ruling is the oldest christian nation oldest christian kingdom to to exist so when we talk about you know western christianity like it's it's really like i mean i don't want to like i don't know where your viewers are and everything but i'm not trying to like like rain on anyone's parade or anything but it's it's the oldest version of what we're practicing in the west that's been highly bastardized over the centuries you know to what we have today in these kind of money grabbing churches where the the, the pastors or the, the ministers are actually trained on how to like get more money out of their congregation and and uh, and you know so so anyway the in in ethiopia they have the term igzaibir igzaibir is like the term for the creator or god you know and if you really look into the etymology and to the, to the, the roots of these words, like Ixaibir, you'll get a better understanding about like understanding the creator as like a whole, you know, like, a, like, like we say the true God, like it's more instead of trying to like uh, superhero him or, or put him in some kind of deity form, it's, it's the creator, it's the creative force from which we all come from, the yad he bad -Heh, they would say in like more modern day Hebrew. But it's it's that the, the from which we all come, almost like if you had a light socket and you and you stuck the cord in there, like the light socket itself, like 
that potential of energy, like that Sikh Zaibir, that that's like God, you know, and, and the cord and then us coming into the light is, is the earth, you know, but we got to tap in, we're the cord tapping into that source. So it's kind of understanding God as, as source and as creator and as, um, you know, the power within you. So it's, you know, it's, it's a lot different viewpoint than that. We just have a savior to look to that's going to solve all our problems. It really puts the responsibility back on you and that the savior is actually inside of each and every one of us. And that's the potential that, that Christ brings, the Christ consciousness brings to the story that it's our responsibility. We have to, there's no superhero coming to save us, but you're, you're the savior, the Armageddon of the mind to become a new you. You know, it's a, it's, it's revelation time for you in your mind. And then you get renewed, you know, and, and born again in, in Christ consciousness, you know? So, so it's a lot of correlating points, but we, we, we like to bring them more. And I'm going a little bit outside of Orthodox Christianity here when I'm talking like this too, but, uh, it's more about the, the trueness of uh, what it means for you to be like Christ or at least to obtain, you know, that Christ consciousness as opposed to uh, going on Sunday, doing your thing and, and then going and just living the Babylon or the, the Matrix style lifestyle. You know, it's, it's the full, the full picture. And yeah, the, um, the roots of Christianity are right there in Ethiopia. You got Lalibela, like these ancient churches hewn out of one rock that they say angels help build, you know, that are unexplainable for a man to tell you how they built that, you know. So it goes back to, if, I don't know if you guys have been studying like these reset periods and stuff that are kind of surfacing in the conscious community. But this, like to me, Ethiopia was like this, this great kingdom, like maybe a Tartarian type situation uh, <clears throat> pre-last reset, you know, like look at Haile Selassie's crown. Um, look at these rock hewn buildings up there. There's pyramid cultures in Ethiopia, you know, there's, it's, it's really close to these metaphysical realities of, uh, Egypt. I mean, it is Egypt basically, you know, Kemet, um, you know, you, the first book in Esther, you, you read about a king that ruled from Ethiopia to India, and that was all the land of Kush, you know, so. So you got people calling Indian straight aired Ethiopians, you know what I mean? And, and vice versa. So when we kind of understand this world that there is this giant kingdom that went from like Ethiopia and uh, Morocco across Saudi Arabia and Iran all the way to India. And there was all these ancient buildings and they all understood the oneness of God. Like we got to be talking, you know, some type of Tartarian or type of like, you know, or even some say when Pluto went to Ethiopia, that was, you know, that was Atlantis. I'm not saying like all that's true or anything, but it's just, you know, to wrap our minds around how special this place really is, you know. Well, you touch on the Tataria and we get down with Tataria, so I don't, I don't want to pass over that. But to go back to one of the first things you said about harnessing your life source and that that's God and that's the creation. And I think that's kind of what makes the most sense, especially when you think about Rastafarianism and you hear about uh, how they eat and it's all about what you put into your temple and what you say, right? The words that come out of your mouth. And I think just to wrap your head around that as, as a human, that makes way more sense as, as God and kind of how to live your life. Like, oh, I have to put good things in me. So, you know, good comes out and I can harness the best version of myself. To me, that's like the easiest thing to wrap your head around of like what God is and how to live. And it really should be that simple, you know, if we're explaining something that that's that's all around us, in us, in our cells, uh, the air that we breathe, the sun that penetrates the, you know, it should be that easy to understand. And shouldn't you shouldn't need an intermediary to tell you what God is, you know what I mean? It, it's that's that defeats the whole purpose, really, of the idea of uh, of you coming into your own being, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's a self-guided self-realization and it should be. It should be simplified um, because that's how simple it really is, you know, and, and what you said is right on point. And I want to get into the diet uh, a little bit, but before that, with with the Ethiopian Orthodoxy, is there uh, a plate? I know you said like Rasta is a lifestyle and a like we were talking about a lot of it is the food and what you say and how you think of those sorts of things, but is there sort of resource like that 
Sunday practice that goes along with it for some. I know it's very individualized to, to what classifies a Rasta, but is are there some that do uh, get into like the church aspect of it? So there, there is definitely, and there's a, there's like a whole gamut of Rastas from like like a guy that just smokes ganja on the street and says his majesty's name a few times a day and then goes and eats chicken and does whatever he wants to like a really hardcore orthodox um, Ethiopian, you know, messianic Hebrew Christian that does his prayers and he fasts on a sun on Saturday on the Sabbath. And, you know, there's there's the whole range. So definitely. But in general, we, we like to, do you know, go by like uh, when Yoshua said in the scripture, like the church should be kind of something you can erect and take down. So we like to congregate in nature more than a, a building per se. And really, like the main congregation points for Rasta communities are these holy days, like um, His Majesty's birthday, um, which is July 23rd, uh, Coronation Day, when His Majesty was crowned the King of Kings of the Earth, which is uh, November 2nd. Um, some of them do Marcus Garvey's birthday. Yeah, airplane flying by. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm out at the park here. I'm over side of the island today but yeah and then um in in general though like some some rastas will lean more towards that orthodoxy side and will go to if there's an orthodox church in the city like la there's a lot of rastas that go to the ethiopian orthodox church in la because they're super welcoming to rastas and they understand like we see eye to eye we're practicing the same vibration here and um you know so there's a whole gamut that runs runs the gamut me myself um i'll usually try to get the people on the island together on those holy days and then there's also a, a good uh, Nyabingi group here and Nyabingi is another not version but we call them mansions or houses of Rastafari and they're the ones known for the drumming uh, the heartbeat drum and there's a couple Nyabingi groups here on the island that will congregate mostly on those holy days more than like a, a, strong, a weekly session or anything like that but definitely keeping the Sabbath is a part of 95 percent of rasta's lifestyle is at least recognizing the sabbath i i don't know if you're not going to travel or not eat that day or any of those kind of things but at least recognizing the sabbath as a rest day is definitely a, a mainstream practice of all rastas okay do you have any any literature or any any books that you would recommend uh for people that want to look more into this or, or you know get, just be more educated on it yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, his majesty himself said is, is the glory, his glory is in the scripture, you know, in the Bible. So, you know, that's a good place to start, you know what I mean? And read that with an open heart and realize, you know, about the metaphysical um, stories in there and the allegories and the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the sun symbology and the celestial symbology and like to know all that stuff, you know, before you just dive in head first and read it literally, you know, to kind of have a basis on some of these like Masonic symbology and stuff. And then you read your scriptures and it and you read it all differently. You know what I mean? But that's a good a good book um, that we all lean on. And um, but as far as like mainstream literature, as far as like educational literature, there's a few books out there. and. and uh, even when I was like a, a young man, I would read these ones, but I think like there's one by this guy last name Barnett, which was his account of going to Jamaica and kind of learning about the Rastas and then reporting on them from like an anthropological point of view. So um, I think it's called the, the Rastas or Rastafari or something by a guy named Barnett, which is written in the late 70s. So he was like there amongst the, these communities. And I'm not one to say that Rastafari started in Jamaica. I'm one to say that Rastafari resurged in Jamaica um, from an ancient practice and even an ancient time before uh, recorded time this lifestyle is from. So it's not from the 1960s or 50s when it sprouted in Jamaica, but that was the resurgence from such a uh, tormented and suffering people that it had to get rebirthed in that, in that environment. But as far as literature goes, there's also a, there's some really thick books on Rasta that come from like a scholarly point of view. And then there's some uh, the the autobiography of his Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie. There's two of those and the autobiography is a good one. I mean, it's a kind of a dry read, but it's really good to kind of see like where the history and this turmoil was. But it, it's not necessarily talking about the 
the uh, lifestyle practice of Rastafari. It's more talking about his majesty's life, but just to kind of see who this man was, to see why why we would recognize him as the Christ on earth, you know, in a modern time, why we think he's the, uh, the um, you know, it, it says in the scripture that he'll come back as a king of kings and lord of lords, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. And why was there a man on the planet earth that was given those titles? Um, without anybody rebuking them or rebutting those titles, but they were actually given to a man on this planet Earth in our, our time, recorded history, those titles were given to a man. And all 72 nations that had any merit on the planet Earth were at that coronation, and they, they were there, they bowed to him. They didn't say, no, don't crown him King of Kings, no, don't give him title, conquering Lion of Judah. They just bowed because they had to recognize all remember these guys are high-ranking freemasons they're high-ranking uh secret society members they know who the solomonic lion is because all that they, they want to be the solomonic line that's all their temples are after the solomonic line the the, the the king david's bloodline you know what i mean that's what freemasonry is based on so these guys are all head masons and they're coming to the king of kings the solomonic dynasties crowning in modern times, they didn't say nothing. They all just bowed their head. And you know, that we're talking about the Duke of Windsor. We're talking about, you know, the, the, the Swiss, the head of the Swiss bank. Like we're talking about huge, huge people that were at this coronation. And they're, and they're, they're saying we're here to crown his majesty, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. None of these people disagreed with that. You know, so if there was anyone on the planet that would have disagreed with that, this is the power elite of the world they're there to bow down you know and this man and who is this man he's like a five foot four little man you know what i mean and he's got a sword on his side and he's he's no he's not uh, he's not like a scary you know he's not like overbearing or like all powerful or wicked like he's just this little man like very christ-like in, in the way that he carries himself so anyway i'm kind of getting more into like my own personal ideology and beliefs here but that's kind of most Rastas are coming from that point of view as well. Um, to, add, to be more poignant to your question, some of these titles are kind of fleeing my mind because it's been so long since I've read them. But there is uh, Frontline Books. That's a great source. So if you find Frontline Books, like they've published a bunch of different, like, um, you know, different Rasta elders have written along the, uh, the over the years. And then there's there is like I said the scholarly point of view with um, that that Barnett book and uh, the other guy that wrote a huge book it's kind of can't remember his name right off the top but there's another one out there that's like they give it out for college courses and stuff. Awesome, thank you. I appreciate the the insight and the information, and we get into get into the talking about the dark arts a little bit so our guests will love you talking about uh, the freemasons bowing down to to selassie they're bowing Ooh. down man that's that yeah. these are the kind of things that convinced me because you know i'm 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 just this 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 kid growing up in america you know what i mean like like and in, in I, I i'm asking questions as an as a young adult of like what is truth you know what is why is everyone christian in the west like what is this you know like because i my like i said my parents were were hippies you know what i mean they're not telling me to who christ is or none of that kind of stuff but then just through through searching you know and not not only researching but searching like literal going and searching you start finding these things and and to me some of that stuff like why are these freemasons who i just learned run the whole world bowing down to this little guy who has all the like the most gold in the world like this guy has the most gold in the world but like no one talks about him like oh why didn't i learn about him in school oh what like these are all clues to me you know to like i better look more into this you know <laughs> something interesting going they're hiding something here you know and you mentioned the bible being the number one source right when you know how to read the bible all the answers are there if you know how to decode look for the allegories and, and the stories what is your favorite Bible passage? Or I know you mentioned Revelation before. Do you have a favorite book? Something that you kind of go to that, you know, you can kind of decode? For sure. For sure. Well, first of all, I like to find I've, I've got about 20 versions of the scripture at my house now. So that was one of the things in my searching. I'm like, what why are they writing so many versions? You know, like, what are all these versions? Like, and then you start comparing and contrasting the versions. So um, I got this one from, it's called the, the, um, 
the Bible Study Institute. And it, I think it might be in Israel or something. But they produced this one scripture and they don't call it the Bible because they're already saying that's like westernized, like lingo. They're calling it the scriptures. And it, uh, and, it, and it also never says God or Jesus in the whole thing. Not that I'm opposed to those terminologies now that I'm a more mature mind as well. But at one point along my trot, I wouldn't say God or Jesus anything. I thought those were also blasphemous words uh, t- taken away from the Creator. But now I've, I've learned differently that it's just how other people understand the truth. And, um, you know, this, this scripture, uh, it's called the scripture from the, uh, the Bible Study Institute. And um, it, does, it like has the ancient Hebrew glyphs. So instead of saying uh, Jesus or Yahshua or Yeshua, it just has the glyph that would be his name because they said they don't want to bastardize his name, you know? So I kind of respect that stuff. But reading through the scripture, like when someone asks me that it's never read scripture or never isn't, doesn't have a Christian background or doesn't have a Rasta background, I always tell them, read Psalms and Proverbs. Psalms and Proverbs, you can't go wrong. All they are is like life lessons, you know what I mean? They're like, and they're straightforward. They're not like, I mean, there's some, definitely some parables in there and some like, um, you know, great like uh, poetry style writing but it's really easy to interpret and kind of see like straight what the teaching is from it and just be able to feed off of that and gain from it right away so the psalms and the proverbs is really where i go and even if i'm going to read something to my son or something that's where i'm going you know i'm not going to like go into the book of kings or and you know into these other like history type books or war type books or god telling you to go slew all these people you know because those are hard to interpret it's hard to wrap your mind why is god saying to go kill people you know so i don't want to like present my son with those stories you know what i mean because that's way too hard to to unpackage and to understand from a young mind so i'll I'll stick with like you know simple simple psalms and proverbs um you know genesis is great for for decoding reality too like in the beginning of Genesis, like in the modern translation, it's like it says in the beginning. But really, if you check out the Yade Bad or the Yad, I, I forget the exact Hebrew pronunciation, but it means after the desolation. You know, so so it's picking up on a, on a new cycle right in the book of Genesis. It's telling you that it's it's not the earth just got created, but it's picking up on this new cycle. You know what I mean? So talking about resets and whatnot, like. Like, honestly, it, a revelation came to me with just in the last year that the scripture was was given as like a blueprint when they did the last reset. They're like, here's this book. It's all in there encoded. If you can break it down, you know, kind of like the Egyptian hieroglyphs, you know, it's like there's some shit about to happen. We're, we're not going to be here too long. We need to write this stuff down, you know. So that's where I see like the scripture as like this. It might be from the last reset, like a like a guidebook or something like that. That's kind of where my mind's been going with it lately. Yeah, I've I've had a a similar thought of something along those lines too. Just because there are different uh, books amongst different religions where they tell kind of the, everyone has like a great flood story. So um, I've, I've I've had that similar thought, and I appreciate all the insight on. on on the Rasta stuff, I, re- I really enjoyed that, and I- I'm going to take a deeper dive into it. I always enjoy getting back into to the music and getting the vibrations and, and feeling good yeah. and-, and being positive with that. So it's much much needed. Now, extending off of that and getting into more on the food side and the farming side, you know, we all often hear, and I've heard you say it, and some of the other rastas and john joseph is another guy that we follow who talks about um, you know he, he always likes to say idol is vital so, it's always vital i was gonna say that right after you answered the <laughs> asked me the question <laughs> <laughs> so if we could get into that you know i also you know uh, in researching watched your watched your video and i had always had a a, a thought that it it was mostly plant-based but you said that you know you can have you know, some Rastas do eat chicken, some eat, eat meat and stuff, maybe more sparingly. But I think that the most important thing is that it's it's as pure as it can be. You know, you're growing it yourself and you're pulling it from the ground or maybe if you're hunting uh, as opposed to like, you're probably not a Rasta if you're going to the 
grocery store or Whole Foods to get your, your produce and all that stuff. Yeah, so definitely, Aital is vital is the key phrase that, that is given amongst the Rasta community. And, and Aital truly, like the definition of Aital would definitely be like, a, you know, no, no, no meat, you know, no, no blood, no bones, you know what I mean? But then again, like I do teach is that there's many walks of life amongst Rastafari and there, there's even Rastas that are eating pork out there, you know, not saying that they're a true hardcore Rasta, but I'm not going to take away from them what they claim to be either. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying that's a tenant, like pork is definitely out of the question when it comes to Rastafari liberty. But um, I tell is vital. Yeah. So this is like a culture that's been teaching this plant based lifestyle ever since its inception you know what i mean so that's why i take it back to like an atlantean tartarian like it's got to be like this pre-culture because when you look into most like indigenous cultures they definitely have some sort of meat in their diet but when you look at most indigenous cultures and ancient cultures the meat is eaten very sparingly it's not like an everyday thing and even when they teach us in school that they hunted and killed mammoths and buffaloes and this and that, that was like one tenth of their diet, if that, you know what I mean? Like, so we need to really understand that like the plants and the seeds and the nuts and the tubers, the plants have really sustained humankind ever since, you know, a lot more than, than the, um, the killing of, of other life to sustain our own. Now, flash forward into 2020, 2022, what do we got? We got old Billy Gates and the boys trying to take over the truth agenda. So that's how I see these guys. Like, what does Rasta teach? Smoke cannabis for the healing of the nation. What does Babylon do? They come and take it over and they open their own dispensaries and kick out all the Rastas from the business and all the old school dads who used to put their neck on the line. They don't, they're not part of the business. It's the chads and the, and the, the suit and ties. They're the ones taking over the industry. You know what I mean? So what does Babylon do? What does the Matrix do? What do the controllers do? They take whatever's true and good and they bastardize it. So that's what tells me even more. Why would Billy Gates be on the vegan thing? Because he wants to bastardize the truth. So nowadays it's almost even like a, to me, it's embarrassing for me to say I'm a vegan. I don't even say it in public anymore. <laughs> Plant based. And that's why I even, um, you know, uh, I've been, you know, it's, listening to a lot of podcasts recently and checking out these different vibes and like yeah hunters like people that fish and hunt their own food like i give it up to those guys you know if you want to raise chickens and do it like that because you feel you need that color caloric intake from like a something super um you know an egg has a lot of nutrients in it you know i'm not saying it's it's good for your body to put eggs over time over time over time but an egg a week a few eggs a month is going to be like a vitamin to your body. You know what I mean? So uh, becoming a mature adult, I'm seeing the food from a broader perspective of, of what is, what is, you know, God given and what is nutritious to the body and what can the body handle and eliminate, you know, cause it can't eliminate and handle processed foods, but it can handle and eliminate whole God given foods. Now, when we get into those terminologies, we got to start looking into hybridization because like Dr. Sebi said, you know, like a chicken itself is a mix between like a golden pheasant and some kind of guinea fowl or something of the two. And then you got this chicken. So once you kind of take two of God's creation and make a man-made creation, well, you're, sti you're sticking a, another airplane, you're sticking a starch molecule to those original makeup structures of that meat. So you're you're actually making it acidic to the to the body. So most meat nowadays is highly acidic to the body, unless we find some of these original sources of animals that more God created than man created. You know, and, and of course God has a, a, a piece in all hybridization. You know, we're just taking two species and breeding them together. You know, so it's it's not like I'm saying like man can like make stuff out of nothing. I'm not trying to be weird like that or anything, but these things that man has decided to to make uh, intermingle like a carrot is a is a is like a you know it, it used to be like this big and, and it started as like a root and then like a tuber or something and they married the two and now you get a carrot but the carrot actually has starch attached to it you know so it's not it's not necessarily like the best thing to eat these like super commercial grade carrots all the time you know you want to find like an old heirloom source you know what i mean and um 
yeah so that's kind of where i'm at with it now I, what i preach now the most is whole food diet you need that you need to be eating stuff from the earth period you know don't eat the, don't eat the fake meat don't eat the unmeat don't eat um you know highly uh, conventional raised meat at all you know find a local farmer if you're into the meat if you're into the milk if you're into the eggs either do it yourself or find a local farmer and treat yourself right treat your body right and uh and like i said too i don't i don't like to to be on the high horse when it comes to diet so 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 i'm open to everybody's diet as long as they're doing it whole food god given and clean you know so that's where i'm at with it now personally i don't eat meat i i avoid dairy um for for personal choice you know what i mean i i I, you know when i when i see these things they just don't appeal to me anymore just from the info and knowledge that i've gained and the palate that i've gained from eating high tall so long you know and and it, it's what's the world of difference too when you eat a vegetable out of your garden compared, compared to a conventionally grown you can give kids zucchini from the store and they'll grow up their whole life saying no nah, zucchini is no good that stuff don't taste good but you feed them one <laughs> zucchini <laughs> you feed them one zucchini from your garden you can eat it raw right off the plant they're gonna love zucchini their whole life because it tastes really good and it makes their body feel good and it was easy to digest and you know so we need to just get back to reality really and get back to our humanness get back to our connection to god and to the earth and and i use those two synonymously you know what i mean so logan you're obviously highly educated on on knowing kind of what food to to mess around with and whatnot like i didn't even know chicken was genetically modified or a carrot and i'm like oh well, man let me pull back let me pull back on that the genetic modification talks about splicing genes and, and actually imploding things so we're not talking we're talking about hybrid hybridization all right so, sorry all right, sorry that i uh, mix your words but my question is someone that's listening to this and wants to get on on the idle path and eating good foods how do you kind of suggest maybe a start maybe what to maybe grow in their yard or in their apartment opposed to like going to whole foods and losing their mind not knowing what oh my god those carrots in her bag i can't eat them like how do you how do you kind of start and not go off the deep end and gradually get into it because obviously you've been doing this for a very long time and it, it takes a while to get to a path where you know obviously you're not condemning people for eating meat and hey you can eat meat and do it the right way it's just not for me but that takes time to get there right right and that's what we got to understand too as, as educators and as friends of humans you know we gotta we gotta see people where they're at you know what i mean and that's a great question what i recommend is is trying to drop one thing at a time you know so make a promise to yourself that you're not going to eat processed foods you know make that promise you know and try to do it and of course if you backslide a little here and there oh well you're going towards the bigger picture you know what i mean so try try one thing at a time say i'm you know i have that weird craving for cheese i wonder if that's an addiction not necessarily like my body telling me i need it and just try to overcome your addiction you know try to cut out the cheese you know one thing at a time um to to answer the question about um about uh something you can grow that's super easy and super nutritious and super valuable greens bro collard greens kale uh, Russian kale, curly kale, chard, Swiss chard, rainbow chard, like these things grow like weeds in your garden and almost in every climate. So I can grow them from Hawaii to like uh, Canada, you know what I mean? And and we anyone can grow greens. They're they're brilliant because you're not waiting for like a fruit set or like a you know an eggplant or a zucchini or a pumpkin. Like they need the right environment for that flower to get pollinated and for the fruit to grow and nothing to damage it and nothing to eat it but these greens they're just the leaves of the plant so they're always vibrant they're always healthy nothing's really eating them because they're growing so fast and you're just out there the more you pick them and the more you eat them the more the plant produces so greens are the are the ticket greens pound for pound have more protein than meat i'll say that again greens pound for pound have more protein than meat you know take it you got to eat a piece of meat that big to make that much greens but still it's it's worth it and, and they taste good you know what i mean i love greens i eat greens with everything you know and, and always have greens in the in, right outside in zone one so in permaculture you plant by zones zone one is usually the stuff you use the most plant greens in zone one put a lot of greens out there um, a lot of herbs those are always easy to grow they're they're bug resistant they're resilient they grow really good 
and they can uh, bring a lot of medicinal value to your food instead of just eating to be full you get a lot of good herbs in there and a lot of uh, raw spices in your body and now you're talking about killing parasites and you're talking about medicinal food you know so um greens 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 I, the, that's my number one recommendation for someone they can do it in their windowsill and then um you know like basils like these plants that are just green leaves that you pick that's that's going to be your easiest plant and a lot of times the most nutritious i think something important that you said too was about being addicted to food i think in our culture we don't see it as a possibility because it's something that we need every day but i think that that is something that if you can wrap your head around that you can get get off the shit right if you can wrap your head around hey this is addictive this is a yeah. mental dependency not a physical it's easier to kind yeah. of wrap your head around well we got you got to check it out like um you check out our biology and and think about a lot of times i'll go back in my mind and of course like everyone has a different picture of this but like original man you know man in his kind of wild environment you know whatever that might have been i don't know even know if man was ever wild but original man like roaming the earth you know this has been broken down to me by other nutrition teachers before and i carry it with me as a, a great teaching man craves three main things because they're not heavily available in in nature sweets fats and uh, salts okay so the creator biologically put this in our body for a reason to to seek after sweets salts and fats because those are kind of in in natural food those are the kind of least accessible you know what i mean so when we came across a nut tree or or something like our bodies told us you better eat like loads of these and take some with you you know and, and or plant some of these because they got high fat in them you know uh we come across a fruit tree or a berry bush okay it's time to load up on sugar like these are sweet eat them you know this is your chance so translate that into the modern era and we got what do we got on the shelves in every gas station every processed food is what sweet salty and fat right where do you get salt in nature you barely get salt in nature you got to be by the ocean or by an old salt mine or get some celery that's high in, in sodium but you're not seeing a lot of salt in nature like uh, readily available to the masses so when when babylon knows this about our our predisposition to to look out for these foods because we need them for our nutrition our brain is pure sugar it runs off of, of glucose you know it runs off of sugar so, so that's why we crave sugar all the time but really we, we should be eating fruit sugar but we replace it with processed sugars you know just to appease that that sensory uh what's telling us to go feed ourselves to feed our brain and then we end up putting something bad because what was available to us because babylon or whoever these world controllers they knew that that's pre um in our dna that we're going to go look for these things so they spread it out on the shelves easy accessible every gas station has it you go somewhere like detroit michigan did you know that there's like places in the in america where there's no grocery store for like 20 miles and that you got to get your groceries from a corner market like a like a gas station or like a a, a liquor store this is like prevalent all across america people don't have access to food I was just in California on a uh, on a uh, a trip over there and I I don't have access to my usual food my coconuts my breadfruit my uh, greens outside my door you know papayas growing on my trees like I don't got access to these things and I'm eating these restaurant food day after day after day and pretty soon you know I'm just got a permanent stomach ache you know because I like my body's just not used to like processing so much starch and so much uh flour and sugar and all these things because like I'm you know I'm I'm of course I'm still trying to eat good but there's only so many resources of actual good food. Yeah, you could be eating plant-based but where that stuff come from, you know? How much yeah, so so yeah, it's um it's uh it's they they got us good, you know, with the addiction side of it because they know what we crave, you know, what I mean, they know what biologically we need. But once you have this knowledge, knowledge is power. so then you can correct those instead of falling for it you know instead of falling for the lie you have the power to see through the lie you know <laughs> like i teach about microbes uh, microbes in the soil microbes uh, on your skin microbes in your belly this is one of my main sources that i teach and i've studied in my life so when when babylon comes and tells me to be scared of a microbe 
guess what? I get a laugh in their face because I have <laughs> all the knowledge about microbiology. I already have it. I don't need to question or look to Fauci or any of these people to tell me what's right because this guy knows. This this brain knows. You know what I mean? So knowledge is power. So if you got the information, they can't take advantage of you. You know? Totally. I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you're saying. I wish I could uh, or we could be doing a little bit more of our own farming uh you know we've had jim gale on from food forest abundance and and he talks about you know the permaculture and that sort of stuff so with with what you have going on are you kind of just layering things you know like you mentioned where you have the greens but you also have the herbs and different things because some things uh you know filter out the bugs or, or you know detract uh, certain pests but then also you know there's certain things where you want bugs because certain bugs you know like people get freak out about spiders in their house but you know a spider is what you want in your house because it's going to eat all the other bugs kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah totally yeah i mean i'm a big proponent of uh you know which is basically kind of modernly translated like um, permaculture design you know which is what you kind of just explained with the you know, you got your canopy layer, you got your ground cover, you got like a mid layer, and each one of these layers is producing something valuable for you or your farm or, uh, you know, your your, your your animals or whatever it may be. And um, I'm a big proponent of that for, for permanent patches on your land. So you're gonna wanna like dedicate parts of your land. So I'm just thinking like if you had a one acre or five acre farm, you're going through making these perma permanent you know, permanent culture, permaculture means it's permanent. Like you, you don't need to go back and, and retill it and replant it. So you're trying to like get it to be self-sustaining. And um, there's way, there's all kinds of ways and methods to do that. But yeah, it, it's all about plant selection too. Like you gotta know your climate and know your, your, your uh, where you are on the planet earth to select the right plant. So you're not getting like some African plant for Canada or some Canadian plant for Hawaii or some, california plant for south america like you're, you're getting the things that grow naturally so you're not fighting nature you're you're just working with nature to produce abundance you know and that's that's the thing it's abundance mentality um babylon tells you scarcity truth god nature tells you abundance like so there's so much there's enough for everyone we should have five billion more humans on the planet because there's enough for everyone you know that's how i feel yeah, the scarcity model is is very toxic, and you know, if if people realize that if they were able to grow all their own food, that they really wouldn't need to rely on the system for much more. Uh, and I also like you know your ref reference to Babylon and what they've done to the the cannabis industry, and that's one of the reasons why I have you know we're going on probably close to over a year of not using cannabis just because it's I. I I don't get down with it anymore just because of what I know, like you said, the suits and, and the other things that have kind of inverted it. But that being said, you do have some very, very pretty plants on your, on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do that thing. You know, it's a, it's part of the lifestyle and it's, it's, it's definitely a, the, the medicine of choice. You know, it's the healing of the nation. I totally respect your position as well. And I feel there's a time and a place for everyone, you know, and for, for these these special things that were given to us as keys on the planet earth and you know the cannabis plant being one of them is this really special key you know um, for alchemists for truth seekers for healers for doctors you know for um thinkers this is really a special plant you know and it really does heal almost anything you know so i uh, definitely don't count it out but i do respect you for uh for knowing yourself you know because that's really what it comes down to know thyself and maybe you don't need cannabis every day maybe you don't need it every week or even every month or every year but you you, you never uh you never put you never can you know you never condemn the mint you know you never tell the rosemary it's bad <laughs> oh totally totally you use it for um, its purpose <laughs> absolutely is is hawaii the ideal climate for just about growing i mean obviously with what you got going on i know you said that there's certain things that are, are specific to certain regions or stuff but uh, in terms of just good climate for growing with the humidity and and the island the volcanic soil is it is it pretty optimal 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great place to grow tropical things. You know what I mean? Tropical things do really, really well here. Um, if you if you treat your farm right, there's very, excuse me, little pest pressure for the right plants. You know what I mean? So like, I'm a big proponent of you know when people start farms over here, I try to tell them like, hey, you might not have the most success with European vegetables, but we're all used to eating European vegetables. And, it, and what we, like is going to blow our mind is that like 90% of the vegetables we eat are European vegetables. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, don't don't like get all excited and just start planting zucchini everywhere and like crook neck squash and, uh, you know, all these kind of giant beefsteak tomatoes. Like that's not going to really be the ticket here in Hawaii. But, um, you know, you get your papaya trees, your bananas, your pineapple, your turmeric, your your ginger, your coconuts, like th these things are gonna prosper and go crazy around here. And then you got your different tuber vegetables like taro and, and sweet potato. And so now you're just kind of changing your palate over from maybe something you might've been raised on from the grocery store and learning how to cook with new foods, you know? So that's really what it comes down to. And even if you're in, in anywhere in America, kind of look around, like what was the indigenous foods here? You know, like how come no one eats acorns anymore in California, you know? and like. I wonder how good acorns could be for a Californian being that that was like the native food of the region, you know? So, you know, we got to start kind of looking into these things and what, you know, what biological imprint does the, does the food from my region give to my body? You know what I mean? If the microbial relationship is going on with that food and then it's also going on with me and then we are eating the same, you know, it's all about compatibility. So if, you know, these problems with digestion and with uh, with circulatory problems and all these kind of things, you know, it, it comes right back down to that. It's like people are eating food that's like not really correctly either grown or, you know, I don't know if you've read like Anastasia, that book Anastasia, but she talks about like putting seeds in your mouth so your so your DNA will transfer, like they'll, they'll encode onto the seed so then the seed grows specifically for your bodily needs so this is like future farming like future reality that we're going to step into when we're actually like planting food because uh it's gonna you know my body needs more calcium so this i don't know tomato or something's gonna produce more calcium for me because i i've encoded myself onto that and and i and i live next to it so it grows for me and for my needs you know and for my family's needs so these are some of the kind of like future technology that we're going to probably see get unveiled here within the next, you know, 50 or 100 years. It's going to be like microbial coated seed pellets, you know, like, um, yeah, I mean, the, the possibilities are like the technology that we can come up with just in a, a natural farming circle, just brainstorming is just blows people's minds, you know what I mean? So I, I got a real good good vision of the future if we can all just uh get these weirdos out of the way you know <laughs> <laughs> logan i appreciate your knowledge and i think having the institute of natural farming out there we educate people to the layers and the complexity of eating well and, and kind of what goes into it and it's different for every person and different for where you live i just think that is crucial and when you first hopped on the call, we had mentioned your logo and Highway Selassie being in the logo, and you had mentioned no one had kind of brought that up or kind of what the meaning for that was. Uh, kind of just go into that if we haven't touched on that yet and kind of what, what the whole purpose of uh, the Institute is and what you guys are doing. Okay, cool. So the Institute um, really is is still kind of in its you know infancy you know so we had a brick and mortar location where we uh we gave the lectures so we had the institute which is actually like a school and we we're giving the lectures there and having like 30 to 40 students come to each class and so when you go to the institute of natural farming youtube channel that's what you're gonna get you're gonna get mostly these lectures from the live classes that we did so like the, the intros are slow because we're like might be taking roll or like something, but you can really get into the meat of it. And they're, they are kind of long, but they're good to play in the background when you're doing farming or cooking or, you know, uh, whatever you, you like to do. But, um, you know, his majesty, to me, all my businesses, 
like I like I also have that record store. Um, I, I've had like other like we we uh, we were the ones that introduced hemp wick to the smoking industry. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but it's like you light a, a piece of uh, beeswax coated wick. Like I, I, me and my wife invented that basically, and, and we're the first ones to market. Thank it you for that yeah, one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we actually That's sold awesome, that company yeah. a few years ago, which helped me as well. But um, but basically, what I'm trying to say is like cannabis. You know, that's hemp. You know, like, like, uh, like His Majesty, like Rastafari, like these things have supported my life, my whole entire life. So it's like a Pandora's box of like, you know, wealth and love is coming, like emanating from this man. You know what I mean? Like, he's got like, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, obviously, other people have their guy, but this was like my guy. You know, <laughs> he like showed me to be a good human being. You know, and. To, like an example of a Christly character, you know what I mean? So, so I give all like my, like love and devotion to this man. Like, I don't even know, it even sounds weird saying it, but like, I feel, I truly feel like he's like this Christ character on earth. And he, he's, he's opened my mind to this reality that I now live in. So I kind of give reverence. That's the word I'm looking for. I give reverence to this man, like for doing this. So he's included in everything, you know? <laughs> so he's the logo. He's a, uh, you know, he's on the wall in my shop. He's, uh, you know, his books are available at the store, you know, so that's why he's on there. And then, and then that tapping into that ancient you know, that pre that Atlantean Tartarian idea, like I get that vibe from him too, you know, and that's like really where I'm seeing the, where the world kind of shifted, you know what I mean? So yeah, just kind of giving reverence to that reality and that Christly character. And then, um, the school itself, like, I actually shut down the brick and mortar trying to direct people over to the website now because I feel like the 12 videos that are up really kind of concrete in if you watch them all you're going to get this really kind of overall view of you know how how you could see the world to make it a better place and to make yourself a better person and to kind of start doing these natural farming practices that are going to really heal things that we've maybe done wrong in the past so I feel it's like a like there, there's some gems in there for people to unlock and and start start this road to a conscious lifestyle you know what i mean so i'm just trying to direct people there right now and to watch those videos before i start making new ones based on more knowledge that i'm gathering so really like up to the point of those videos like like honestly you know i like i i don't really feel like i have too much more of course or you can always go in depth and get into more subjects and there's always more but th those videos are the basis of this reality that i'm trying to show people you know look guys we can do this like empower yourself like sovereignty is a must you know uh self self-sufficiency um you know if you if you got your food you got your water you got your power you got your medicine like there goes babylon's thing like because they that's all their power over you you know like you're dependent systems so if we start shedding away their systems and start to adopt wholer you know community driven systems we're gonna they're gonna lose power like just through our lifestyle so that's that's really what i'm trying to portray with the school is like hey guys if we can change the way we farm the way we eat the way we talk the way we look at the world the power structures are just gonna dwindle we won't have to fight anyone we won't have to kill anyone. We won't have to burn down buildings. None of that. We'll just have to grow food. <laughs> so, like, my solution is is super on point. You know what I mean? I got these solutions. And, uh, um, brother man, what's up, bro? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we're just at the beach here. See, brother man in the back cruising. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean that's really the message with the uh, with the institute, bro. It's like it's like we got we got the answers, like we got solutions. They got problems. Babylon's got the problems, bro. We got the solutions. Humans have always had the solutions. Humans are ready made for this earth. We're ready made for the earth, bro. Like we came in with the whole package, the skin and the fingers, the sensory organs, the nose, the ears. We got it all. So we don't need nothing from them. Uh, we need to get back to self-sufficiency. And that's the message of the school, you know, let's but in go. the future, too. The, yeah, let's go, man. The, in the future, too, there's going to be more classes. But really, I'm looking forward to even just bringing the message out. And, and these podcasts have really been a great outlet, you know, besides the channel and besides the actual just 40 students at a class. You know, we need to get the masses this information, you know, no doubt. 
Logan, you are definitely speaking our language. We are all about the positivity, self-sustainability, autonomy, uh, spirituality, all that good stuff. So Smoking we, good weed. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, we really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your insight with us, uh, not only on, on the farming stuff, but definitely the Rasta stuff as well. Before I ask the first rapid fire question, got a quick question. Did you say you're in Hilo? Hawaii? I'm, in, I'm actually from Kona, but I drove to Hilo today and, and, um, and I just pulled over at this park to talk to you guys. <laughs> you, uh, any BJ Penn sightings? Oh, BJ Penn, bro. He's the man for governor, bro. <laughs> Hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> no, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's got his posters up everywhere. I, I definitely saw, saw some of them. And, yo, I mean, to tell you the truth, like all of us regular humans here on, on the Big Island are... are in hawaii or behind that dude man like what like like i don't know i don't know any i'm not down with the politics or the politicians and i really try my best to stay out of it but it's in our faces now man it's literally in our faces now i mean i'm i'm you know was was you know i don't even want to talk about it but anyway this that guy he does give a little bit of hope and hope goes a long way so i'm, I'm supporting him you know Right on. That's awesome. That's how we know Hilo because of BJ Penn, huge MMA yeah, fans bro. back Native. when he was big. Yeah. Yes, um, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so first rapid fire question. I think I might know the answer to this, but uh, Logan, are you cat? Are you coffee drinker? Coffee? Did you say yeah. coffee? I don't yeah. Espresso at three o'clock every day, bro. <laughs> Let's go. All right, you you answered my question. <laughs> Logan, do you have any daily practices or rituals that you do on a regular basis to show up as the strongest version of yourself? Wow, that's a great question. That's a great question, bro. Um, the daily ritual that I really do every single day is I smoke big hash rips, you know what I mean? And I, and I give my reverence to God every single time that I partake in those hash rips. And it's, for me, it's a spiritual experience, nothing to do with recreation very little to do with medicinal 99 percent to do with spiritual practice of making myself a better man so getting into that theta brain wave you know getting into that creative place in your mind which cannabis brings you to is kind of where i like to be almost like all day because it just makes life kind of make more sense you know so um cannabis induces that that brain set you know that you get into like maybe you're gonna sit down to do like a drawing or you're gonna sit down to meditate well like like that's the wavelength of brain that comes you know the, your brain waves go to that i believe it's theta could could be a different one but i believe it's theta brain wave and that's kind of where i like to be you know and, and yeah enjoying cannabis as a ritual and as a spiritual practice daily do you have like a time that you do that and maybe like a prayer or some intent that you put into that before you do it? Yeah. So a lot of times, like if I'm in a group setting, we'll usually like maybe recite like a, a, a scripture verse, like, you know, how good and that pleasant it is for I and I to dwell in unity. You know, it's like a precious ointment upon I and I beard, you know, so we get into like scripture maybe before we partake as a group, but, um, individually i'll usually just i'll say a verbal prayer out loud like um a short one and then i'll i'll go ahead and partake just to put myself in the right mindset amen. yeah amen <laughs> logan what are you listening to right now music wise audiobooks i know you said you're listening to some podcasts any podcasts are you reading anything yeah man um so the recent books that I've really been blowing my mind, I, I revisited Anastasia again just because I was like t trying to tell my little sister to read it and stuff. So I revisited Anastasia. I really like that one. Um, if, if I could, you know, get people to read one book, it would be One Straw Revolution by Masako Fukuoka. I think that book alone will help the world heal. One Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka. He's the, uh, he kind of coined the phrase natural farming and um, Buddha fa Buddhist farming. But, but if you read that book, you'll, that's like, 
what I'm trying to obtain myself is to be more like Masanobu Fukuoka. <laughs> um, music wise, um, really like any any old school reggae like is always good for me to play. Um, more recent artists like uh, Kabaka Pyramid is a really good artist. Um, a Raging Fire Band is a really good band to check out. Um, these are some of uh, kind of the, the new wave reggae artists that are keeping it real. Um, and then as far as podcasts go, you know, Crow Triple Seven Radio, man. Like, like I don't know. Like that guy just he's like this older dude. You know, he's not. He just like brings things to the table that make me go research them. You know, they make me go dive deeper and like. He's so nonchalant and just like non like aggressive with how he like presents information that I really like it. And I don't know, like he's just opened my mind to so many things that I've dove into that have been been more doors and more doors where I don't even think he's trying to do that. You know what I mean? So um, Crow Triple Seven Radio, and then also those guys, uh, the Alpha Vedic. Um, you guys check yeah. those guys out, Fairlando. Yeah, I really like their their podcast too and on the same way you know just like bringing like relevant information that people might not think about so much you know what i mean so those those are definitely podcasts that i look out for and then just uh yeah i mean just yeah just kind of searching you know really what the, the best part is is like what comes to you on your own searching you know what i mean like like you might have this like i don't know if, if like it's like weird to think like this but maybe like if god works through technology but like things will pop up in your life like when they're supposed to you know what i mean and it might be on your phone or something that it, that you got it and it was might be an ai algorithm i don't know but but it but like there's something like like some teachings like right there you know what i mean so kind of just paying attention to life and kind of like like instead of forcing things these days i kind of wait to see what comes my way when it comes to information you know so I don't I don't do too much like YouTube searching anymore or anything like that, but just kind of what comes my way. Because now, as as like an older, uh, mature mind, it's like I gotta be careful what goes in it. <laughs> like I gotta make space, you know. Yeah. Like like okay, wait, like how's this gonna fit into my paradigm? And then you know you gotta like massage it in there and make sense of, of this new information that you got. You know. So yeah, I would say you know. I, reggae music is it's really healing you know it's it's that heartbeat music you know like ross michael like if you want to listen to some old school naya bingi ross michael you know i love ross michael it's like real churchical reggae music like more spiritual reggae you know so yeah the brat is in the back <laughs> <laughs> do you what's your go-to miguel collins track miguel collins um sizzla Sizzla is like one of my favorite artists of all time, bro. Um, he's been, he's been, if you listen to the, the album, The Real Thing, that's like one of my favorite, The, the Real Thing, D-A, The Real Thing, like it's, it's a little more like in, in the middle of his career and that one just hits. But then like his old, old stuff, like Black Woman and Child, wow, man, like that album will blow your mind, you know what I mean? So, uh, black woman and child album um the real thing album and then that that song is the uh thank you mama for the nine months you carried me through all the pain and the suffering you know that that song thank you mama is one of my favorite songs from it makes me almost cry every time i hear it you know sizzla definitely yeah. check out sizzla he's he's the don man and if you check out sizzla like you're gonna get everything from girl oh <laughs> there you go everything from like girl tunes to like party tunes and crazy because he's like a he's just a real human being he's living his life you know what i mean he's appealing to all kinds of people you know what i mean but he's a church of rasta man at heart he's the head of the nyabingi and bobo ashanti house right now in jamaica so don't don't get fooled by his like party music and stuff he's a, he's the real deal you know excellent last but certainly not least what is your favorite conspiracy theory or what brought you to the game? <laughs> that that's, hasn't been proven true. <laughs> <laughs> that's still a conspiracy. That proven. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure which ones are true and which ones are actually conspiracies at this point. But right. um, um, shoot, 
what is going on out there really i mean the one that's blowing my mind the most is like what like what's really going on with the resets you know that's the latest one that's blowing my mind it's like because i i i got this feeling like i don't even know but the feelings always told me like we've lived in a grander time like we didn't go on this linear scale towards pinnacling at 2022 like i feel like we've definitely pinnacled somewhere else and we're living on the shit side of something <laughs> now you know so no like doubt. i know that i got this feeling i know like because agriculture at one point like, like humans have fed themselves all these hundreds of thousands of years bro and like all of a sudden in just like 50 years we can kill the top layer of soil like what the fuck is that you know what i mean like how did we kill the soil so fast you know so like to me there had to be like a grander time when we were super like more like yeah it, that's what that that conspiracy of like when was that grander time and like how do we get back to it that's been blowing my mind the most you know but like all the jfk and the 9 11 like like the jfk one like i have no clue where to go because i was too young but like all the ones that have happened in my lifetime like they're like so easy to see through now it's like bro like that that veil was way too thin you guys didn't even try you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah very unoriginal too these days it seems like yeah it's like they're so easy to see through and it's like only you get this i don't know how they get them I don't, are the masses still believing it or just a small population of the masses but it's it's kind of crazy to witness how well like the um the tv and the media like spells like, work on the masses it's so interesting to witness when they don't work on me at all <laughs> yeah. yeah it's funny i was listening to uh comedian jim brewer yesterday on i think he was talking with jp spears but they were talking about like you know how long did you believe uh you know how long were you like where doing this and i was like never <laughs> never right never, never. That story like what are you talking about i had so many holes in it from the first time i saw it on the news you know from the jump i was like this is bullshit <laughs> right for real yeah. right off the jump exactly the signatures are there the signatures yeah. of bullshit you know yeah but I do like what you're saying about the resets. That's kind of been a very uh, made a film about it. Yeah, interesting topic that we've kind of dove into and, and been a very good distraction from the other nonsense. And I right. find the, the the architecture aspect of it so fascinating. Big time. Um, Big time. And, yeah, the cathedral thing and stuff. Yeah. Like, come on, guys. The iron bars, like that stuff that Howdy McCoskey is bringing to the table and stuff. Like, that shit's mind blowing, bro. And it makes so much sense. The wooden the wooden benches for the church now like nailed in with like hammers and, and like drilled in with like modern like screws and stuff when like the rest of it's ancient like sound healing bath like that makes way more sense you know because we didn't need to cut ourselves open we could go get a sound healing bath at the church yeah. you know like makes way more sense bro and i'm all about stuff that makes sense you know totally and, and just one last thing to touch on too you know you mentioned with the uh the, the churches in lalibaba lalibella Lali yeah right, Nella, sorry um and there's uh thought that or they say that the ark of the covenant is there yeah the ark of the covenant's actually at the church of Maryam. the church of mary i believe is the one they claim and it's it's like no one can go in there you know what i mean like they don't let nobody in the holy of holies where this is supposed to be stored you know they said if you look at it then you then you die you know what i mean it's like you know that's like the box that contains the glory of god you know like it's such a shrouded mysterious thing and the, and even if you watch these like history channel things and you know like like they won't go directly and tell you but some of them will they're like we're in ethiopia because that's where all the the, the ancient books point to you know so do I think so? Like, probably. Like, do I know? Like, of course not. But, um, but yeah. I mean, I'm I'm of I'm of the belief that they got whatever is that Ark of the Covenant there. You know, because if you read those old stories of uh, that that are took it out of the modern scripture of of Solomon's bloodline actually moving from Israel to Ethiopia. See, that's what most people don't understand is that Solomon's first son was named Menelik. And he was the son of Queen of Sheba. Sheba is from Ethiopia. So she came seeking the glory and wisdom of Solomon. Well, Solomon tricked her into sleeping with him, how the story goes, and impregnated her with, with Solomon's heir to his throne. So a lot of people don't understand that they followed the bloodline through Jacob, Jacobum. Uh, I think I'm saying that right. 
jo- Joachim, something like that. But that's where like the lineage is followed through the Israel king bloodline. But nobody pays attention to his firstborn son who was born in Ethiopia. And that's what that, if you read that story, that's when they take the Ark of the Covenant because the head priest actually were backing Menelik up. The head priest wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be in a safer place. So he let him take it with him to Ethiopia when he left Israel and went to Ethiopia. So we have a historical document. Uh, I wouldn't call it fairy tale, but you know, we got uh, or fable or any of those words, but more of like, I mean, it could be a, a story that's magnified over time to be maybe more than it is, but I don't know. But we do have a story that's documenting the moving of the Ark of the Covenant in to Ethiopia and to me not many people have like rebutted that it's they've only assured it even history channel and whatnot Logan we appreciate your insight you are a, a wealth of knowledge the history lesson the, the, the topic of Rastafarianism is, is amazing I'm really gonna have to go back and listen and take some more notes on this one but I thank you so much for your time this afternoon this evening Logan, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I am lit right now. I'm stoked to go watch Sunset. Uh, thank you for all the uh, knowledge information you're putting out there and the work you're doing. You're doing God's work, brother. Thank you so much. <laughs> Little piece of the action here. Elo Bay. Can't beat that. Paradise. Yes, sir. Respect to you guys, too, man. One love. One love. Have a, Have good a great one, night. Brother. Thank you, sir. All right. Blessings. Thank you.